Chapter 12 is about chemical bonding, how atoms stick together to form molecules and compounds. I see I forgot to take the animations out of this presentation as well. We'll just have to deal with it. So questions we should think about, we're not going to answer them right now, but these kind of float these around in the back of your head while we're talking about this stuff. What do we mean when we say chemical bond? What exactly is that? Why do atoms bond together to form compounds? And how do they bond together to form compounds? These are some of the questions that we'll hopefully be answering in this chapter. So there's, there's not a simple and complete way to define what a chemical bond is. Um, a chemical bond includes the forces that hold groups of atoms together and make them function as a unit. We've talked about water and we've drawn pictures of water molecules. And we know that when you freeze water, the hydrogen and, and oxygen atoms stay together, and when you melt it and boil it and pour it into a cup, it all stays together. And it's the chemical bonds, there's forces that keep those atoms together in a molecule, and they function as a unit. Um, it really comes down to energy. A bond such as this between oxygen and hydrogen will form if the energy of it together is lower than the energy of it separate. Aggregate just means the whole thing together. So if this molecule has lower energy than the individual atoms, the bonds will form and you'll have that molecule. So if that's lower in energy, then to pull these guys apart is going to require some energy, and that's called a, the bond energy. It's the energy required to break a chemical bond. So there are two main types of bonding. One of them is ionic bonding. Ionic bonding happens when we've got a metal reacting with a nonmetal. And this coincides with what we talked about in nomenclature, where we learned how to name ionic compounds, and we identified them as containing a metal and one or more nonmetals. So ionic bonding happens when a metal reacts with a nonmetal. So here we have an illustration, a metal and a nonmetal. And what happens is there's an electron that's transferred. The metal atom loses an electron and forms a cation. The nonmetal gains that electron and forms an anion. Now we have a positive and a negative charge. Those opposite charges attract each other, and that's what an ionic bond is. It's the, the attraction between oppositely charged ions. And then we have covalent bonding. Covalent has two parts in that word. There's co and valent. Co means sharing. In a covalent bond, we've got electrons that are being shared. So here's an illustration. Here we have a hydrogen atom and another hydrogen atom and they each have one proton in their nucleus and one electron out here. And they're, they're separate from each other. There's no interaction or attraction between them. When we bring them close enough together, um, there will be a simultaneous attraction between the electron on this atom and the nucleus on the other atom. And what they'll end up doing is sharing their electrons in between. And that causes an attraction between those two nuclei to that shared pair of electrons and causes the covalent bond. So what's important for you to understand is that an ionic bond involves transfer of electrons from one atom to another, and a covalent bond involves electrons being shared. Now, sometimes atoms share equally and sometimes they share not so equally, kind of like children. So the word polar, what do you think of when you think of polar? 
polar bears. And where did polar bears live? Where it's cold by the North Pole, right? Our planet has a North Pole and a South Pole. And there's this magnetic field on our planet, and that's why a compass always points towards the North Pole. It's a separation. There's one end of the planet that's different than the other end, even though it's round and doesn't really have an end, does it? Polar means that the two sides are different. So in a polar covalent bond, we still have sharing. There's that prefix co, but it's unequal. There's unequal sharing. So one atom attracts the electrons more than the other atom, and this results in a partial charge separation. So if we look at this picture here, when hydrogen and fluorine share a pair of electrons, they don't share equally. Fluorine hogs the electrons. It's kind of like, you know, sharing covers with your husband in bed, and somehow you always just get a little bit, and he's got most of the blankets. It's unequal sharing. So here, fluorine is hogging the electrons, still sharing with hydrogen. Hydrogen didn't give them up, didn't give its electron up, but they're not being shared equally. And so this results in um, a little bit of a charge separation. So the fluorine end of this molecule is slightly negative. It's not a full negative one charge. It's a partial charge, and we don't care exactly what the partial charge is. It's just between 0 and 1. And so we use this Greek letter delta, which is kind of small on there. It's a lowercase Greek delta. It's just kind of like a, kind of like a D with scoliosis or a hunchback or something. Um, and that means a partial charge. So we can have a partial negative or a partial positive charge. And we use that to indicate which end of this bond is a little bit negative and which end is a little bit positive. Well, let's go back to that. Fabulous. So let's look at this, this guy. I'm going to draw him a little bigger. So here's fluorine and here's hydrogen. And hydrogen is sharing one electron with fluorine, and fluorine is sharing one electron with hydrogen, and that's what causes the covalent bond. Electrons um, are like little boys. I told you, I think I told you, maybe it was the other class. They remind me of Andrew, my five-year-old. But we can imagine that these electrons are two little boys that are good friends. And this electron lives at the H house, and this electron lives at the F house. And the houses are not the same. Over at the F house, they have um, satellite TV. They've got a giant plasma screen television. They've got actually a soda fountain in their kitchen. And the freezer is full of frozen pizzas, so you can heat up anytime you want. And mom, mom lets you do anything. They've got a swimming pool and a trampoline. And over here at Hydrogen's house, um, they don't have cable even. They just have network television on a little tiny TV. And if you're hungry, mom will give you bread and butter and a glass of water. So these two little boys are going to play together. Where are they going to spend more time? They're going to spend more time at the F house because it's more attractive to little boys, right? Fluorine, the atom, is more attractive to these electrons. And so even though these electrons are being shared between, they're going to spend more time over there. It doesn't mean that they're never going to go over here. They're, they're still going to go over here. This little guy, you know, says hi to his mom occasionally, and he probably goes back to sleep at night, changes clothes and stuff, but they spend most of their time over here. It's not that the fluorine house has adopted this little boy. He still belongs to the hydrogen. These, they're still sharing between, but they're spending more time at one house than the other. Does that make sense? That's a polar covalent bond. It's an unequal sharing. When you have something like hydrogen and hydrogen, now both of those houses are maybe not that fun to play at, but they're the same right? 
the attraction for these electrons of this hydrogen atom and this hydrogen atom is exactly the same. The attraction for the little boys at these houses is the same. And so they're going to spend a more equal time at each house, and it will be evenly distributed, and there's no lopsidedness. So what do we mean by the term chemical bond? Like I said, there's not a quick and easy answer to that. But it's the forces that hold atoms together in a compound, right? Forces of attraction. And we talked about two kinds of bonds, ionic, where the electrons are transferred, and then you have this attraction of opposite charges, and covalent, where the electrons are shared. What's the driving force? Why do atoms bond with each other? Why would they do that? It has to do with energy. Is it a higher energy state or a lower energy state when they become a molecule? It's lower. So you may think, but high energy is good. Well, it's, we, in our world, it would, uh, we could consider the energy to be money, okay? And so if, one way you could think about this is, so here's the hydrogen and the oxygen in the, as the water, and here they are separately. So if these guys are going to stay separately, maybe they have to go get apartments or something, three apartments, that's going to cost them more money, right? So it's going to be a higher cost. If they move in together and share an apartment, they're going to save money, right? It'll be more efficient financially. When the atoms bond together to form a stable molecule, the energy cost is lower. It's like rolling a ball down a hill. We talked about that. That's not a hill. We put a ball on the hill, and it's going to roll down, right, to a lower potential energy state. So the reason that atoms form molecules is because by doing so, they can have lower energy. And everything's going to go towards lower energy, just like things always roll down the hill. They do not roll up the hill. How do atoms kind of answered this one after the first question, but how do they bond with each other? There's two ways. What happens in an ionic bond? It has to do with electrons. The electrons are transferred from one to the other, and so then what, what causes the, um, those ions to stick together? The charges? Opposite charges attract. So we can have a transfer of electrons, and what's the other option? Metal, non-metal is the, the transfer. What if they're not willing to give up an electron? Then they share. Okay? So a metal is willing to just say, no, you just take the electron, it's fine. And then after he gives up that electron, then that non-metal starts to look really nice to him because there's this opposite charge thing going on. Between non-metals, they both want that electron. One isn't willing to give it up. So the solution when two people want the same thing is you share, right? So they share the electrons. Any questions? <laughs>